Chapter 8, China and the World, East Asian Connections. Section 4, China and the Eurasian World Economy. Hope you guys are picking up on how important China was, not just to uh, Asian history, but Eurasian history. Okay, China's economic growth. Uh, this would really be the time during the Tang and the Song dynasties was not contained within its borders. They, were, they had an impact throughout all of Eurasia. Um, they were the recipient and the donor in many economic transactions, uh, a lot of give and take, a lot of trade during the third wave uh, era of civilizations. And their economic achievements, is a, a lot of it's due to the stimulus with the, because of the contact they had with others. All right, spillovers, China's impact on Eurasia. Many of China's technological innovations spread beyond its borders. Uh, salt production through uh, solar evaporation, paper making, uh, printing, although resisted by the Islamic world in Central Asia and Southwest Asia, uh, printing was still popular in Far East Asia. Gunpowder, which was invented around 1,000, it was used differently after it reached Europe um, and the Muslims, but uh, still very important. Uh, the salt, the paper, and the printing, China's dynamic economy and technological innovations spread, like I said, far beyond its borders. And many of them, many of these were adapted or adopted by the Islamic world and Europe. Um, paper was a huge innovation that spread uh, very quickly. Um, the Muslim cultures valued calligraphy, uh, that handwritten style of writing, and so they didn't really take to printing. Um, but the Europeans would develop printing uh, when it became used to paper. So printing wasn't necessarily uh, popular in Europe until it was used for paper. And it's unclear if there's a Chinese influence on European printing, but paper and printing allowed for the spread of literacy in Europe and stimulating important changes in the coming centuries, um, especially the development of vernacular, which is one owns one's own language. Um, and we, we see the uh, development of multiple languages um, after the fall of Rome with, uh, you know, stemming from Latin, which is what most Romans spoke. But also influences from uh, many of those Germanic tribes, because English, uh, Swedish, German, and maybe Norwegian are a Germanic language. I believe Finnish, Finland, um, that's a whole other language family, I'm pretty sure. Those are Germanic languages. And of course, the Romance languages, which stem from Latin, Spanish, Italian, Romanian, French... Uh, those Portuguese, those um, are a different uh, language uh, family. Um, Chinese textile and metallurgical and na uh, naval technologies all stimulated from the imitation and innovation like the magnetic compass. Um, the magnetic compass was very important. Uh, some technologies were modified and ex expanded beyond China. Gunpowder, um, for example, was a key component of warfare uh, by Muslim armies um, that made cannons, and Europeans would eventually develop personal firearms because of the gunpowder. So that had a huge impact on uh, non-Chinese people. Uh, sailors around the world tinkered with the technology of the compass and, of course, adapting it to their specific needs. But these finished goods, uh, the Chinese textiles and some of these other goods, uh, porcelain, silk, lacquerware, um, the vibrant Chinese economy produced these finished goods for export to long-distant markets. In return, the Chinese began to consume commodities like the spices from um, the Southeast Asian islands. And this process served to build uh, mutual dependent markets of consumers and producers within these civilizations. 
Um, I think the, the next one, um, yes, okay. It's a picture of uh, lacquerware. Some of you probably are like, what's lacquerware? Well, uh, I bet some of you have probably seen this somewhere. Maybe um, your great aunt or grandma or I don't know, an antique show. I don't know. TV, who knows? I'm sure some you guys have seen this somewhere. Uh, but this is lacquerware. So, uh, just wanted to give you a visual in case you weren't quite sure what it was. Okay, now China on the receiving end, right? The economic beneficiary, as opposed to um, China's impact on Eurasia. Um... The Chinese learned cotton and sugar cultivation and processing from India. Um, China was transformed around 1,000 by the introduction of a of new rice strains from strains from Vietnam. Remember, we kind of I mentioned that earlier. It's the Champa rice, hence the name Champa, which you guys saw for, on the map, southern part of what is now present day Vietnam. Um, it was a much faster rice and so that really transformed their rice cultivation. Um, China's contact with the outside world also allowed technology, ideas, and crops to just flow into China. Um, from India, like I talked about, how to raise cotton and sugarcane. And these became important sectors of the Chinese agricultural um, sector. From Vietnam, China gained a faster growing rice, um, and it, it really did well in the southern Yang, uh, Yangtze Basin in China, and this led to major growth in population and a big shift of China's demographic balance from north to south. Um, the technological creativity that was spurred from cross-cultural -con contact was also important. And their growing participation in the Indian Ocean trade is also uh, important. There were um, foreign merchant settlements in southern Chinese ports by the Tang era. And sometimes that brought violence. There was a massive massacre of foreigners in Canton in the 870s. There's also a transformation of southern China to production for export as opposed to subsistence. Uh, before they had produced just what they needed, but now they began to produce so much that they could export. And thus we see the development of these cosmopolitan cities and respected merchants, um, even the monkey gods. Um, you're probably going, what in the world? What she mean by that? Well, um, thanks to the connections with the Indian Ocean Basin trade, the cities along coastal China soon um, saw the development of communities from Southeast Asia, India, Persia, Arabia, all over the place. Um, and there were Buddhist, Muslim, and Hindu places of worship and where people could go study. And like I said, violence could erupt between the different ethnic communities, like that massacre in the 870s, but trade with the Indian Ocean world created major economic growth in South China. Um, the merchants increasingly gained a new social acceptance, um, and they overcame that uh, the disdain that set in from the Confucian ideas and the how low the merchants were. And the culture of the Indian Ocean world also entered in the form of popular stories, and that's where the monkey gods come from. Uh, the tales of a monkey god uh, derived from a Hindu deity, and that's a, an Indian influence. I want to go back a slide, and yeah, I want to talk about these Persian windmills and Buddhist printing. Uh, from Persia, China learned of windmills and developed a similar technology. Um, the spread of the Buddhist world in China led to the development of printed images and texts. Um, as devout Buddhists wanted images of the Buddha 
and those religious texts, they could be carried as charms. And so that spread rapidly. And in the Tang Dynasty, Buddhist monasteries transformed the practice of printing uh, with seals into printing with blocks. And that's where the development of wood block printing comes, comes in. And the first printed book was the Buddhist classic, the Diamond Sutra. And a Buddhist monk from India first identified the soils that contained a saltpeter that were flammable, leading to the formula for gunpowder. So, just wanted to let you guys know about that. Okay, and I think that is it. Uh, yeah, that's it for section four.